Good morning, Misfits. You are tuning into another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Full Goon Squad in the house. Yo. As always, the absolute best way to support this podcast and what we do is by heading to properfuel.co. Use the code word Misfit for the best supplements in the game. Sharpentheaxco.com. Use your favorite athlete code. And obviously, the best programming in the world is at MisfitAthletics.com for your individual programming needs and TeamMisfit.com for your affiliate programming needs. On today's episode, we are going to be talking about if there is a quarterfinals prep camp. And if there's not a quarterfinals prep camp, what does that mean? When would there be a camp? All that good stuff. We'll dig into that. And then today's topic um, that we're going to, you know, do in a more traditional sense is talking about the gap between an athlete's abilities and what they think their abilities are and then what they project out into the world. And those can conjure up a million different scenarios, I think, in everyone's head right off the bat. Um, Hypothetical scenarios, scenarios that play out in real time at our gym and with remote clients and all that. But um, it's very top of mind because I've been communicating with a handful of athletes about it quite a bit in the last year. Um, I also think it gives you a peek into the the world of remote coaching and, and what exactly that is. And not just like, hey, you shouldn't do thrusters, you should do back squats something of that nature but of course before we get into that the life chat and i'm not going to go first because our gym almost blew away yesterday so there's that <laughs> yeah that's true that was wild I, uh, yeah it's pretty wild windstorm here yesterday my basement has a half inch of water in it in parts of it not the entire thing Fuck. which is nice we're built on like a basically like a cliff where i'm in westbrook which sounds weird because it's not really known for its mountain ranges but but basically on a giant rock slab. Lovely inside of Westbrook, <laughs> And when you go in my backyard, is this giant oak tree at the base of it. Literally is like a lake right now in my backyard, which only happens when we have crazy windstorms and rain like we did yesterday. So got home and there was about a qu- quarter inch, half inch of standing water on half the, uh, the floor. Thankfully, the, the dogs and their crates are in the complete opposite corner for during the day because they can't be left loose in the house because they'll destroy my house every single time we're not there. So, <laughs> and each um, other? Well... Yeah, not have, much anymore. If, if, if there's food left out, you know, hot dog buns, someone will lose in the air. But, oh, 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 baby. Um, I mean, if you want to how many alone in the house, and how many hot dog, dog buns? buns? How many <laughs> yeah, hot dog buns you got laying around your house right now, Sherb? Currently zero because it's twenty or thirty. Side. You give me a, a you know, let's wait it's four a bad more months day to be a Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> we wait four more months, a little warmer outside. Maybe a few. Um, yeah. So, light chat was going home and draining my <laughs> my my basement, which hasn't happened since the storm of Jordan Cook and. 2018 or oh, 17 whatever that was awesome he was so mad at me when i told everyone that he <laughs> shit in your basement basically um Correct. silver lining can you send zion down there with some puddle boots on to do some heavy stomping because he would uh, probably he, love he, that he prefers socks he wants to get his socks as wet as possible <laughs> and then instantly like freak out that they're wet <laughs> god yeah, so he thought it was great to bring a toy down there and he had, a, a, he had like a boat you know going down he's, there yes. he's already exhibiting your psychopath tendencies though <laughs> yes exactly has, like the warble you know, passed on halfway window halfway down oh car window god. into that too i actually had that yesterday <laughs> which you normally wouldn't have in winter but i was driving gas cans inside of an suv so i had the windows <laughs> down and it's a real lovely noise <laughs> real no good time. nice well, Room's still like no freedom. power for me. Fuck. Lovely. Yeah. Hey, so I mean, there's whatever 40 houses out there, so they're like, yeah, we'll <laughs> get to you after the population Christmas. centers, basically. True. Sure. Good stuff. Good stuff. Hunty, how was the golf simulator yesterday? It was sick. It was great. 50% <laughs> off. There? I was one of the only ones there. It was it was sweet. <laughs> great time. Um, yeah. All, the one that this- pads your stats? No, no, this there were I mean, no stats one. being padded. Damn. This, this this one seemed a little more realistic, so. Um, this will be my last, I'll make this the last golf-related life chat for the season. Shame. But, yeah. Doubt it. Played, got out. <laughs> well, I guess it depends. If the weather, if the weather, if it keeps being 50 degrees and sunny on, like, Fridays and Saturdays, then I won't, uh, then that won't be the case. But I think everything's closed now, and especially after 
that shitstorm that happened yesterday. But finished first year, year one, best score was 89. So what? pretty pretty happy about that. Yeah, 17 broke. breakfast balls. Broke zero breakfast <laughs> balls. Zero breakfast balls and a lot of frozen fairways and greens. So some uh, remind some me what's a breakfast ball. Breakfast mulligan. ball is like you get the, uh, the mulligan on like the first hole. It's like you okay. shank, so you shank your first one, you get a tee up another one, and it doesn't kind of get to you. But how far none under of that, par is that for the course? None of that. An 89. No. How no, far no. under par? <laughs> very, very, very far from under par. <laughs> it's over. well done under it par. Was, it was like, <laughs> it's like 19 over par, yeah. <laughs> what is par at Riverside? Uh, 70? 72? I wasn't at Riverside. It was at Nunsuch, and Nunsuch is a 70. It's a relatively yep. short course too, so that these courses, the courses that I'm like playing on, aren't like overly difficult. But I would say that the frozen fairway, frozen greens, couple of couple of balls How that can you would have otherwise, mile? couple of balls that would have otherwise landed and stayed on the green, landed on the green and then proceeded to bounce like 40 feet in the air <laughs> over the cart path onto That's awesome. other <laughs> frozen components of the course. So it's like the slam ball in the parking lot. Yeah. Slam golf. So yeah, too much. Uh, fucking, yeah, a little bit too much juice towards the parking lot, and someone's gonna I get a should, have a go golf ball in the worm burners seat. You could, dude. Miles. You you get a you get a couple <laughs> worm burners that'll just run for six hundred yards. I had, I had a handful <laughs> of them that probably roll, rolled farther worm than they carried. Burners. But yeah, a little yeah, grass cutter. It's a worm burner. <laughs> yeah, so the ball gets as high up the ground. <laughs> so she burns the worms. <laughs> goes by. <laughs> it's supposed to go in the air in golf. I don't know if you a lot of golf, Ted, but. Well, let's go in the air. Mine goes about oh. two inches off the ground the whole time. It's like bowling. Yeah, my I my, have my... some gifs of Sherb at Top Golf um, that I made. Nice. And he's literally only swings side to side, like as if he was paddling someone's ass. <laughs> That's how he swings a golf club. It's wild. Bro, if, I can, if I connect, it's going nine hundred yards. <laughs> Just got to think. You don't know where. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what yeah, direction. Yeah. That I didn't say which direction there. Yeah, okay. I didn't say which direction. Gonna say. Yeah, no, that's fine. The balls went straight up and came straight down in front of me about eight yards away. <laughs> Let's get you drove them straight into the ground first. Let's throw with that. <laughs> God damn it! A different game. <clears throat> what you got, Ted? How do you guys cook your eggs? If you were gonna just eat eggs for like I don't know breakfast or whatever, what's your go-to cooking? Fried over easy. Eggs only. I mean, you're going to put them or on like, something else, like a right, sandwich toast. or something. That matters. Toast. Yeah, if yeah. I'm going to like throw them in a bowl or something like that, I'll go scrambled just so I can add like, I'll probably do like some kind of cheese and hot sauce or something like that. But I am definitely more of a fried egg type person, like on toast or something like that. That's definitely my jam. I'm like an over, over easy so that I can dip yeah. some, like an English muffin or something yolk. like that into the yolk. Have you ever butter basted your eggs? Yes. Only butter based oh, on the weekends. Yeah. Goodness. Oh it's, yeah. It's become my like go to a little bit of oil. I to put too many eggs in the pan and then I just don't have any oh. space. But <laughs> Yeah, well, you could to use a bigger pan, bro. I needed a bigger pan. <laughs> yeah, no, a little oil and like, I don't know, two or three tablespoons of butter in the pan. You let that thing get ripping hot. You slam those eggs in there, you get them nice and crispy. And you just kind of base the top of them. Woo! Michael Simon had a like eggs over like Asian rice recipe once that was like that. And you did like a little chili crisp on the yep. egg after yep. you did the basting. But I feel like I did it with like olive oil. I don't think olive oil I and butter. I usually do olive oil and butter. Yeah. Because the olive oil tends to stop the butter, butter from, like, from burning. burning. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Ted, do you then a stainless water. steel pan, or do you, I know you have one of those like fancy, like made in nonstick pans. So I remember we talked about it a long time I, ago. But I, use... honestly, I really rarely use nonstick. I pretty much use stainless for everything. I don't. Mm -hmm. There's not much that I use nonstick. I'm like trash. Use stain. I use the nonstick. Buy it from Walmart. Well, use the nonstick for eggs. <laughs> That's the easiest. If you if you yeah, stainless, you just get it ripping hot first, and then pretty much nothing's gonna stick to it. What's so the um, it what's this old olive oil butter trick? I don't know this. It's just like you don't have to flip your eggs. Yeah, and get a tablespoon crispy. of olive oil and then butter, mm -hmm. and you let the butter like kind of bubble off because that's like the water getting out of it, and then yep. you just cook it in like like it's oil, but it's okay. buttery, more buttery and delicious. It's always smoke. You can paste the top so you don't have to flip them, and the bottom gets really crispy. Yeah, mm. so you know how like a lot of places will either do that or like stick it under like a salamander or something like that, so they have the yeah, nice yeah. like pretty presentation. You can make some like 
honestly, it's sort of like the quail egg vibe at yeah, okay. Oda. Yeah. yeah, a little yeah, crisp yeah. on the outside. I don't like the crisp. so good. What? I keep the temperature. Yeah, I get it hot and then I turn it down. I like the- You like them sloppy like, and runny? No, they're not like even white and like runny. I just don't. I just don't sloppy, want the bottom you? crispy. They're cooked. Why not? Like you don't like flavor? Or? No, I just don't like the. I, I don't like. <laughs> I feel like it just hair. rips the egg apart. Like when I'm cutting well, it, like yeah, it can just. You, it makes it a little tougher. But if you're putting it on a sandwich, you're just cutting it with your teeth anyway. But I'm not putting it on a sandwich, so <laughs> there. Fucking put it on a sandwich, bro. Ooh, do we want to get into what a breakfast sandwich is? <laughs> yeah, it's not yeah, a cheeseburger. That's for goddamn sure. <laughs> Um, my life chat is I don't have power. I don't have internet. I woke up at 3 a.m. drenched in sweat, shivering. My throat was swollen. You have COVID? So, You're instant sweat, no. shivering? I did, I did take a test this morning. Um, normally I would just stay home, but I don't have, I can't do anything at home. Like anything. And I ain't got fucking time for that shit. So here yeah. I am. I'd say it's my flu game again, but I already used that excuse like a month ago, so. <laughs> Every just seems like apart. fucking half the gym was hacking up along during today's class that I was watching. Really? Because I work out yeah. balls. People are getting. What was it today? It was box chip over dumbbell hang clean and jerk, but it's just no reason to stop. So you go really fast for like four to seven minutes and everyone's it's tired. Back to back days. Because yesterday good, was. Good for him. Let the people know what yesterday was. Uh, 10 minute AMRAP, six Good old fashioned do a burpee. So, like, no target, no lateral, what? no bar facing. Well, just like stand all the way Translated, up. Translated. Six burpees. Yeah. Do a real burpee. <laughs> uh, nine deadlifts at 115, 75, and then 12 uh, wall balls. So, basically, no reason to stop. Set your hair on fire for 10 straight minutes and then three minute rest and a three rep max deadlift. So, kind of a earn your right to. What were the rounds you can actually range get them tired. on that? I think the best was probably close to nine. I don't know if anyone's got the same idea. We had a couple second round for most. No, nah, we had a we had a couple over over nine, but we didn't have really? anybody. No imam. Oh, imam. No imams. Uh, uh, that's one that if you did it twice, you could get a lot closer to imaming. You kind of get to know exactly feel. what it feels like and like how how much you can toe the line at the beginning. Because some workouts yeah. make sense to go close to even rounds, and other ones it's like you got to get a few fifty second rounds in there to buy yourself that's the some time. That's kind of the workout with the affiliate that I like. I think sometimes the pacing advice or like coaches trying to give athletes a peek behind the curtain of what it's going to be like might actually be to their like detriment. This is one of those workouts where I was like, it's burpees, it's light deadlifts, it's wall balls. Everything should be unbroken and fast. Go as hard as you can. Go. Because I think sometimes we just go like, hey, make sure you know you don't go too fast and you take some transition time here and chalk your hands there, grab some water, like. Maybe it's a bit of extreme, but at the same time, if you talk them out of going hard, they lose a big part of the stimulus. So I was like, it's light, it's fast, go as hard as you can. I'll see you in 10 minutes. Go. And it works. I love those. Too, where it comes out in the wash as well. Yeah. Like you have this amazing strategy and you just feel bad at different parts of the workout than the other person or the same version of yourself that did it differently. We also have those old open workouts where it's like your capacity is about eight rounds and you might get a little bit ahead of yourself and then come back down to earth at eight rounds you might do it even you might do negative splits but like you're not going to do more in 10 minutes than that my favorite part about those workouts is that even the people in affiliate class who come in and typically you know like you've got people who like kind of try like 70 percent the people who <laughs> like to grab water like in the middle of the workout you know that sort of athlete even they get annihilated by that kind of workout that's great that's, yep. the, that's the best part fittest people obviously get annihilated but you get people who when you program like a good workout and you're like ah yeah everybody's gonna die and then only like the people who tried hard died everybody else like just didn't maybe try hard enough to to die this was one of those <laughs> workouts where like it didn't matter no place to like, hire you were gonna die yeah no place to hide. Did a run soda bar hang dumbbell snatch like two years ago and it was actually one of those ones where when you went hard at the beginning, you realized that it wasn't hard enough. That like if you actually wanted to put in a bunch of rounds, you had to do certain moves. You had, had to run because it was a short run. I think maybe like out and back or something like that. So the 100 meter run or the 150. And you realized that there just wasn't enough metabolic demand built into a round that you had to run hard, which you like in a cardio self. Exactly. A lot of times in a cardio piece, the the run is the moderator. It's like, how how hard can I go here? And for a lot of people, it's not that hard. If I want to stay unbroken on the other stuff, but I just remember it being like, 
shit, I think I can go a little bit faster. Shit, I think I can go a little bit faster, like the whole time. And by the end, I was absolutely annihilated. I'm trying yeah. to remember what that workout is. I don't remember it either. Mm. Who knows if I made it up and class did something completely different, but it's awesome. <laughs> I do remember everyone getting their asses handed to them. It wasn't just me. We try, we try to do that regularly around here. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're going to talk about uh, camps, quarterfinals prep camp. We've done the summer camp. We have done off-season camps, things of that nature. I'm going to go like uh, full transparency mode here because the people listening to this podcast are the same people that come back to camp after camp after camp. Um, and basically where we're at right now is – with the way that they can be about announcing the season um, and the rule changes, it makes it makes it really hard for us to plan what we're going to do for a camp. And obviously, like we have international travelers for a camp, and we don't want to deliver that information to people at the last minute. Um, there's also the team implications. So we normally have quarterfinals prep camp on that final open workout um, weekend. So then you have a gap before quarterfinals. And this year, um, if you're going to be on a team, you need to be in the affiliate itself um, that you would be training in. So you might want to come to camp. You can't because then your quarterfinals teams don't count. They're letting more athletes in um, in basically every division. So that it just on our end sort of implies that um, we would have less participation at quarterfinals prep camp. Um, that being said, because we have the diehards, the, the people who – support us, come to camps, listen to this podcast, you know, shop the the gear and all that stuff. We feel like no matter what, we owe you guys at least one camp per year. Um, it's a really good opportunity for us to see you guys if we don't get to see you when we're traveling for competitions. Um, probably more importantly, it's a really good opportunity for you guys to see each other. Um, and basically what I want to do is open the floor up to like customer requests and feedback. Um, we're going to plan a camp in 2024. I want to know when people want it to happen and where they want it to happen. So if you want to want to come back to Maine, um, there's a team misfit affiliate or, or someone that follows the blog. That's an affiliate owner, um, want to host us. You know, we've, we've taken the show on the road quite a bit in the past. Um, there are some implications there as well. So, um, feedback can be thrown into, I mean, it can be thrown on this episode if you're watching it on YouTube. Um, Discord would be a great spot for it. And my email address is coach at misfitathletics.com. If you have a request, if you want to host a camp, that sort of thing, reach out to me. Um, basically, we're going to have a camp. We want to have a camp. We want to see you guys. We don't know exactly when or where it should be. And that's, for me, the easiest way to do this is to say we have... Um, so many people that are listening to this podcast to get in that crossover and come to camps. So let us know what you think. I don't know if you guys have any it's comments. Summer. Summer's the best around here. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love, I mean, I'd, I'll just put it out there that I'd love to be able to travel for a camp again. I think that was a, that was always yep. a really fun time. If you're a, a an athlete, a, a coach, or even an owner of a gym or something like that, and would be interested, like, like Drew said, there are some implications to that. And there are reasons that we didn't, we did that for a long time and and it's tough to do it it was it became difficult to do it because of the implications for the host facility more so even maybe probably more so than us but um i think it'd be awesome to be able to travel i know there's a handful of our athletes who live in you know major areas and even if it's only even if it's something like a boston area new york city area somewhere that's relatively close to us you know but maybe more central for for other folks like that's you know we we love to we love show up like, let's go the whole all four of us like to like to travel whether it's for yeah. work or personally so um yeah not exactly any <laughs> any any guidance for for people other than hey if you want to host no, and, us and we'd, we'd love to the, the for the sake of transparency basically there's a for us to be able to travel we have to set a minimum ticket purchase so if you're the host and we say you need to get at least 15 people to sign up before we like book our travel um, or like we'll book it. But if 11 people sign up, the gym itself has to pay for the final four people. Um, and I have requested and received checks from small business owners 
that I took no pride in taking in, like small business owners ourselves as well. Um, and we're covering our own ass and taking care of our community and our employees and all that. And that's why we have to do it. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not the most fun thing in the world. We had quite a few camps where there were a shitload of signups and it wasn't an issue at all. Um, and we'd love to get back to that point. Um, so yeah, let us know what you guys want us to do. We're open. All right, Jen. Let's go. Let's talk about athletes' perceptions of themselves, both internally and externally, compared to the real story, the actual ability of the athlete. Um, I can queue up a few examples for you guys that basically go in both directions. We can talk about what those mean. Um, you guys can jump right in right now and say, I have this scenario, um, but there's a lot of directions this can be taken. I'll, I'll start with uh, this will be a, a good starting place because it's kind of like regarding a like scaled affiliate level athlete. And I think that extrapolates all the way up to I'm a CrossFit Games athlete in the right context. But we so we our our affiliate for better or worse has like the but uh, the um let's say let's say it's we we pride ourselves on holding athletes to a very high standard we hold our coaches to a very high standard and one of the most frequent things we get from athletes who come to our affiliate from a different one is that oh i always taught or i was always told or i i always thought that this place was big and scary and super intimidating and it was a little so intimidating scary. the first time that i came in but it turns out like everybody's awesome there's more there are way more there are more scaled athletes than there are you know quarterfinal and semi le final level we like we don't have any in-house semi-final level athletes currently we have a lot of very fit rx level affiliate athletes and we also we have and we have far more athletes who scale workouts like on the on a daily basis we have a lot of athletes who through for whatever reason that that go very deep you know all the way probably back to childhood um the perception of i'm i don't like to report my score on the whiteboard or i only come in on certain days because if i come in on this day with things that i'm bad at uh people are going to notice and people are going to see my score on the whiteboard and they're going to think that i don't belong here or that i'm i'm embarrassing or that you know whatever it is and so the the solution to that is I'm not going to come to the gym at all. And again, we can extrapolate this to a competitor who says I'm not going to announce my intention to be competitive or to, you know, to throw down in a workout that I'm going to lose in for sure or something like that. And a lot of times I have these conversations with athletes that I'm like, hey, and especially not, this is not to put down athletes who scale workouts or anything like that. But it, this is a blanket statement. There are. I could, pro I could count probably on one finger the number of people who are going up to the whiteboard and are looking for your score. <laughs> they don't fucking care. And as soon as that whiteboard gets wiped on Friday evening, it's gone. And as soon as, you know, as, so ba as soon as the day turns over, I could probably count on fewer than one finger the number of people who come in and check yesterday's scores. One, people can do it on the app. Two, more importantly, no people cares. don't fucking care. No <laughs> one cares. No one cares. But the point is, is that like, people, athletes have kind of this this envision, especially in certain places and maybe at certain gyms, that like, oh, people are constantly judging my performance. What I based on what I put on the whiteboard, what my lifting number was for the day, what my Metcon score was, or whatever. And the reality is that like. Every single person is really only paying attention to themselves short of, you know, the couple people who like to compete with each other. And they already know who they're racing against and they already know that they're racing against each other. And it's like, I know this and you know that and you know that I know and you know that I know that you know that we're racing. But for everybody else, like, peop no one's paying attention. Yeah, exactly. Hunter. No one's paying attention <laughs> to your performance eggs. in class and nobody is judging you for what score gets put on the whiteboard on a fucking random Tuesday in December in Maine. Um, so I think that's just like a, a good, I think that gives us like a good starting place because I think that applies to 
athletes of all levels. I'm referring to, you know, a couple instances at our gym, but it's like, hey, hey, man, like, I promise you, no one cares. Like, you care, you care the most about what other people may think. And I got news for you. Nobody thinks anything about it. Like, period. Like, yeah, the the way that I've sort of redirected my thinking on this is trying to speak their language a bit more. And it comes from working with someone on a complex movement and having them, like, execute on a cue and seeing them light up with, like, that was easier, that was more efficient. I felt so much better about that movement. Um, so I try to figure out what is the way to make them feel very similar to that within the guise of the mental game. So like basically what you're talking about, Hunter, is someone um, needs to bridge the gap between I'm like not confident in this scenario and I am confident in this scenario. And if you won't come in, like how are you supposed to bridge that gap? Um, And I think that there are like multiple steps when it comes to this where it's like, okay, step one in that scenario is probably just showing up on that day, right? Like, I I still don't feel amazing about doing the actual workout, putting my score down, um, evaluating my score afterwards, that sort of thing. But you have to be able to give, in in my opinion, an athlete some form of a step-by-step way to look at this stuff so that they can go back and try to make some changes. Um, Because otherwise you might be digging into a realm that they're not ready to talk about. Like with the remote coaching side, we all know what happens once that trust factor starts to develop. You are able to have deeper conversations and go there, but you might not have that relationship with that athlete at the affiliate level in the same way that you normally would. You know, they like, it's a lot safer for someone to tell you how insecure they are via text, right? Um, than, Than it is for them to be able to come into the gym and say flat out, I didn't show up because I don't like this, that sort of thing. So I really like to try to find ways to say very clearly, you're here, you want to be here. What is a step that you can take to get yourself back into that spot? It's funny you say that. We have a a pretty gnarly workout within Hash It. It's the three rounds each for time of devil's press, legless rope climbs, and yoke carries. And I had an athlete reach out to me this morning. And say that these dumbbell, these devil's press are going to take me a long time. And I said, okay. She said, do you want me to do this? I said, yes. <laughs> She's like, well, I'm going to go slow. Workout's like, going to be pretty hard. You sure you want me to do this? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I was just like, yes, I understand that's going to be challenging for you. But like, that's the intention. If you look at the workout and we talk all the time about understanding with your athlete IQ, kind of what the stimulus of the workout is. I don't think anyone looks at that work and go, oh, nice cardio. That looks easy. That's not the stimulus. The stimulus is getting stuck. And the only way you're going to make a step forward at this, be able to do this kind of workout is to see what you got. You got to go into the workout and know that like part of your development as an athlete is that you're going to do some fucking workouts where you stand around a bunch or you go really, really, really slow because you have to figure stuff out. Not everything that you do every single day needs to blast you with intensity in the term, like the ways of like super high heart rate or muscles burning because you just did a thousand chest of our pull-ups in a row. Sometimes it's figuring things out on the fly and learning to adapt because you put yourself up to things that are going to cause you to fail. Like you look at that workout, you might say, all right, six devil's presses at that weight. That's, uh, that's, that's a minute. Well, great. Next time you do it, maybe it's 58 seconds. That's improvement. It's being able to find those little things in workouts and understanding that like you won't get better at them if you constantly avoid them. And you know, this is a workout where this athlete can do these movements. It will not be fast for some of the workout, but that's okay because you got, I don't know, look at the day to the right or left. Oh, look at that. You got some bike sprints. You got this, you know, with the high heart rate, the muscle burn kind of vibe to it. So just don't get it twisted that every single workout needs to feel the same way or have the same response or that you need to keep up with somebody else. Like, like Hunter said, no one's fucking accessing your Google sheet and going, all right, on December 19th of 2023, this took this person 39 minutes. Oh, they suck. I'm never gonna watch this again. No no one cares. It's like the commercial where the guy says, have a good flight as well to that woman and everyone's like why would you say that like i don't even want to go on vacation anymore like have you seen that commercial sherb no, you know what i'm talking no, about no, no. so so the the woman says have a nice flight that's working at security and he says you too and obviously that happens all the time and it's not a big deal but everyone in this scenario is like 
why would you say that? I'm not flying anywhere. He was like, kids don't want to go on vacation anymore. <laughs> it's, that's that. the same. That's the fear yeah, it is the versus thing. the like, like silly reality. And I, I love what you're talking about. And, and that's, uh, that goes out to, guess what? Games athletes have glaring weaknesses when it comes to movements. And I keep them in there. And I say, don't care. You know, it's whatever. It's November. It's December. I don't care about your transitions. I don't care about the echo bike pace because I know you're going to blast that. I don't care about the wall balls. I care about the devil's press or I care about this. Like when you start that movement, you turn it up to a nine out of 10 effort. And then that will put you in a body bag basically. And you need to deal with it the rest of the workout with those other movements. But we already know you can go there in those other movements and we need to make progress with this. And some of that progress will be physical adaptation, but so much of it will be mental adaptation. Like how many, how many devil's press are in that workout total? Uh, 18? 45 total? 40, 45, 45? 50, 15 per round. So it's 15, one of those like okay. sprint, oh, sprintable it. kind of vibe, like right. big rest and the repeat. Yeah. Like that's really a, sp- that, that's, <laughs> that's a laboratory for like breaking some shit, you know, talk about eggs earlier, making some omelets, like go in there and get after it and find out what the actual reality of this situation is versus the conversation we've had a million times on here of like inanimate objects don't give a flying fuck about you so like having an opinion of like wow that big scary nylon rope that's dangling from the beam has it out for me i don't stand a chance if that is part of quarterfinals that sort of thing i think like a lot of this a lot of the a lot of this comes down to the conversation an athlete has in their own head uh, and as somebody who is perpetually to often to my own detriment, like overthinking things like that, as opposed to kind of I, I hate the term being present because it just feels like it's been overused in the last you like to lose yourself in five, the moment, you know, five years or whatever. It's good. Thanks, it's, baby. Good. Uh, it's the but it, it's the idea that like you're as an athlete, like if. How many things are you thinking about that are, one, not happening in real life and, two, not beneficial with with respect to your training? So kind of the initial example of is, you know, am I thinking to myself that, oh, like five or six people are watching me, they're judging my performance, they are thinking about how they can, they're, they're taking my times down or my splits so that they can beat me. All of these thoughts that an athlete might have in their head, most of which aren't actually happening in real life in any way, but because they're happening in your head, they are effectively happening in your reality. And I think that's a becomes a huge detriment to the athlete's mentality. And it also it's an detracts. Energy suck. It's, an it's an energy, energy suck. suck. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. It detracts from what Drew was just saying, where it's like, hey, I don't care about your bike pace. I don't care about this. I don't care about that. I care about this one single thing. Your responsibility as the athlete today is to block out all of the other noise and focus on this one single thing and understand that your success or failure today is solely based on whether or not you paid attention to this one specific thing. Ignore the, you know, the the self-talk that you're having about other people that isn't actually happening in real life and pay attention to what is actually happening in the place that you are at the time that you're doing it and a lot of it is that kind of idea of being a little bit more present within with the context of your training higher level uh, athlete iq is paying attention to things that actually matter no one fucking cares what your workout score is in november it's what you do in the open it's what you do in quarterfinals it's what you do when the actual lights are actually on and it actually does matter where you are ranked and other people can see it and allows you to advance later in the competition like if you're you want to really double down on athlete IQ, it's paying attention to the metrics that actually matter, which I think too many athletes get lost in the sauce of like, I won this single workout because I was able to do these muscle ups, even though I biked really slow, despite the fact that I'm a really good muscle burner and a terrible biker, just paying attention to the wrong metrics. Yeah. And if you, if you constantly are in a workout and your mind is on a workout that you've already done a previous workout, how well are you going to execute? If you're in a workout and you're 19 seconds in, and you're thinking about, am I going to get this done by 1730? How well are you going to do? If you're always mentally all the way in the past or all the way in the future, what's going on? Then you get a wheelhouse workout and you get an opportunity to hunter earmuffs, be present in the workout and just execute and do the thing. You crush it. You're, you know, you look back at your heart rate data and it's not all over the place. 
you have to ask yourself, like, can I reverse engineer this? Because the, the, the thing that people cannot get through their fucking heads and uh, all the way to the highest levels is fitness. It's a fitness test, right? Like Kenzie Riley with her, I can't do a legless rope climb and then comes in first in the highest volume program, the legless rope climb workout we've ever fucking seen, like that sort of thing. It is a fitness test. That workout also had what, sure, 4,500 meters of rowing in it or something like that? Yeah, like 2K, a lot of other ones. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, 3,500 like, meters of rowing. What, like that. If, if they write a workout that ends up actually bringing your insecurity to light, it probably sucks or you're not fit. That's a whole separate thing. But like, if, if you're like, I don't like this movement and it, they just tell you like, like okay, it's, it's 12.1, redone as uh legless rope climbs for seven minutes or something like that like is that should that be in there is oh, that a good I hope workout that's, i hope that's 14.1 <laughs> seven minutes legless rope climbs 14.1 14. 14. you're getting your time machine bro 14 what i say 17 14 it's 20 14 24 14, 14, 14 yeah. whatever <laughs> what decade is it six where am i um, decade is it i want to talk about another thing that i think goes unnoticed especially by younger people this is kind of a, a life lesson that takes a little while insecurity wears many hats it presents itself in very different ways like the most annoyingly confident boastful cocky person that you know might just be the most insecure human that you know deep down they might not be aware of it they might not have accepted that they might have created this scenario based on some of the stuff that Hunter reference before it might be kind of deep seated, but insecurity presents itself in that way just as much, if not more than I'm a, a six out of 10 objectively, but I think I'm a three, that sort of thing. So insecurity shows up in so many different ways. And then there's also athletes that do both. There are athletes that will like tell every, anyone and everyone who will hear it that they, whatever, like strict pressed 205 when Sherb only strict pressed 195. And they're just telling you that all the time. And you're like, why Like, why is he doing that? But then at the same time, we'll be like, I know that I'm terrible at burpees or rowing or whatever, and I can't do those things. Drew, and that's sort of take the mask off. <laughs> what the fuck, dude? Get out of my face. It's not me. It's, it's, a, it's a hypothetical. It's a mask of her friend. Um, but, so we can't have both of those. You can be both of those people simultaneously. You can, you can put it out there, hey, I do have this one thing that I excel at, and I'm going to make sure that everyone on earth knows what that is. And then I'm also going to be self-deprecating about the things that I don't want to work on and get better at. Um, I would say the, the thing that, like, kills me, that, like, breaks my heart is when an athlete does put all of the work in, like, truly, like all of the, you know, the, the other 23 hours that we referenced, the lifestyle, the training, the warm-ups, the cool-downs, the mobility, all of this stuff, they make all of these sacrifices and they can't get it into their head that they are as good as they are. Like, and that's why, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this in the, in the you know, sort of purview of a remote <clears throat> coach, because if we get you from, again, sort of weird and, and doesn't really work as a metric, but a 10 out of 10 is the CrossFit Games champion, and a 1 out of 10 is, like, last place in the Open. Like, we can get you from, objectively, from a 4 to a 6 or a 7 or whatever, but if the athlete goes into a competition thinking that they cannot execute, that they don't belong there, that, like, whatever level of competition that they should be a shoe in for, they don't believe that either, um, that's brutal to me. And I've I've... I want to hear what you guys think about that, but I've actually changed the way that I communicate with athletes about that scenario. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a situation right now. I don't, I don't have an athlete like that currently on my roster that's actively competing in the sport. Yeah. Um, but I do have an athlete that's probably coming that, well, not probably coming back, is coming back from a life event that um, is going to set this, this, the stage that we're going to be severely below what our all time best was just based on the fact that, that, you know, this person had a child and that is a traumatic life event that requires healing and time to get better. Um, and I have to take the, um, the stance of, you know, 
you basically wipe the slate clean and you have an opportunity to reset your metrics and that you shouldn't feel like you'll never get back to where you were, but you need to pay attention to where you are now and what you can do, like you said earlier on, find the the single thing you can get better at today and stack enough of those days ahead of you or, you know, in your, so I should say, behind you in the rear view mirror. And the more that you do that and the more you pay attention to that, there's a very strong chance you can surpass your former self, but it's creating awareness around that so you don't get burnt out and don't get frustrated ahead of having the opportunity to stack enough of those days. Because I do think a lot of athletes get a, you know, they get a string of seven really good days, they have one or two off, and then they take more time off because of that. Instead of just saying, wipe the slate clean and keep going. And because of that, there's always looked like this move forward five, drop back three, move forward one, drop back four. And, you know, if you look at the line across the trend line across all that, it's basically stays even keel because there's not a consistency in growing across the entire timeline, even if it's only 1% better each single time you do that. I don't know if you guys have seen that graph of like, you get 1% better every single day for a year. You get like 37% better across the entire year from start to finish from your, you know, from baseline to the end of the year. But if you get 1% worse, you only go down like, I don't remember what it is. It's less than like 10%. But the idea here is that you need to stack enough positive days that you trend in the right direction. And a lot of times it just takes a change in mindset to realize like you can control what you can control right now. And that should be really the focus for the day as opposed to like worrying about six months down the road, a year down the road, five years down the road. Yeah, it's it's a little tricky because there's a lot of there's obviously a lot of factors that go into that. I think that if if you have an if you're an athlete or you have an athlete coaching an athlete who performs well you know outside of competition and then when when it's three two one go time there's all of a sudden this it's like i forgot everything that i i knew or everything that i've been training every every like but the confidence goes down again i think that becomes a i think that's just a a, a mindset issue of what you you are you are fabricating in your mind the level of your competition and then are also setting the stage for your own kind of failure as opposed to as opposed to taking the training that you have been doing and thinking about like okay how like cuz ultimately like every individual has a ceiling right you you can only if whatever the workout is you can only go so fast and your responsibility as an athlete is to take the training that you've the work that you've put in and apply that as efficiently as possible and whatever the result is i like whatever the result is is what you is what it is i guess um yeah i'm i'm kind of i'm honestly i'm kind of feel like i'm kind of bumblefucking my way through this a little bit it's a it's a tough it's a tough scenario well um, if, if the three of us weren't being recorded right now and we were having this conversation and looking for advice from one another like there is a part of this type of conversation that's trying to gain perspective by throwing a bunch of ideas around to to see what kind of makes sense to you um i the the thing for me is like i believe that if someone that is in that scenario has that inner monologue um that it's somebody else's voice um and it's not theirs mm -hmm. and i really feel like giving yourself an opportunity to figure out what your own voice is and what you believe based on the actual information is is an amount of progress that you can make as a remote coach, especially when there isn't a lot of like backstory um, to the relationship that you have with an athlete. If you just get started with that athlete, um, you can really rewrite that narrative because it's almost like, wait, what the fuck? What are you talking about? Like you think what? Why? We just we just did that thing. It just happened in real life. I just watched you. How how are we having this conversation about that? Um, and then you can start to kind of worm your way in there a little bit. And the way that I have communicated it to a handful of people within the last like maybe eighteen months or so is the the, the tragedy here is the relationship that the person has with themselves. Like yeah. so many people are wrapped up in like, let's say it's a competitor here um, at the gym. They want to know what the expectation is from the three of us in our office. What is the expectation here? They expect me to execute within this way. Like, what does my significant other think? What does, what do my parents think of how I'm doing within this? 
and again, someone else is writing the narrative, but then you are essentially giving yourself that out, which is, which is to me what I really hate about the situation. It is easier to be really good at something and say I'm not good at it or I'm like hesitant, I'm not so sure. Because again, we've talked about this a ton in the past, you have an out. You can go to semifinals of the CrossFit Games and be like, I fucking told you so. And that's a relationship that someone has to repair with themselves. And as a coach, you're trying to, again, fill those gaps. And you're trying to zero in on what actually is it. If you're insecure, let me know what it is. Is it your rowing? Okay. Like, where do you want to be? Okay, this is where you are right now. You hold a 155 and your 2K, you want to be at a 150. Like, let's talk through what that progression looks like. We're going to celebrate 154 and 153 and 152 and 151. And we're going to take ourselves there. But then at that point, there's still a huge level of responsibility on the athlete to say, I did get better at this. I am better at this. That narrative is gone. I have to let that go. Um, and, and one of the things that's popping into my head right now is we have a bunch of listeners that do not have a remote coach or do not have someone that they're able to talk to about this. How we rewrite that narrative without that level of help. I mean, I, I'd have that athlete, you know, tell me what their thing that they're trying to work on is. Nah, whatever solo. the movement is. Solo. So you solo? You're talking right, to them. Well, here, you're talking to them right fine. now. Fine. <laughs> write down the thing you want to get better at. All right. Write that thing down. Then, every time you do said thing, make a tally mark and write a little note to yourself about what went well and what you could do better next time. Six months from now, reevaluate how many times you've done that said thing and what your notes say. And ask yourself, am I better at that thing? If you do enough of it, you'll get better at it. But the hard thing is, is showing up and putting up in the work when you don't feel like you're making the progress you want and being okay with that. I think the predetermined notion of like, if I work on this for 10 seconds, I should be the best in the world at it is just so ridiculous. But it happens to everybody at every level. It's, you know, we talk about this with our gymnastics day out in our affiliate. We ask someone like, hey, I want, I want to get muscle ups. And it's like, all right, great. How many of these days you made? Well, I made two out of five. All right, not great. How often do you work on your strict pull-ups? Not really. All right, how about what's the last time you worked on your push-ups and dips? Hmm, yeah, they're in a workout. All right, we got a really easy plan here. Show up to all the gymnastics days, work on your strict pull-up, work on your push-ups, work on your dips, and come to, you know, again, come to all these days. When you do that consistently, come talk to me again, and I'll show you where you are and what's next. And usually when you create the, you know, the breadcrumbs on the trail of how to get there, that's enough for helping an athlete to realize that that's what you have to do. I'm sorry it's boring. It's again, some of these things that like you see CrossFit Games athletes, you know, swinging them for 15 unbroken muscle ups and they're cleaning 275 right after. Like, do you know how many times they fucking went and did a workout with three muscle ups in it and 10 muscle ups in it and 12 muscle ups in it and they did it in two sets and three sets and 10 sets and it just kept showing up, showing up and plugging in, plugging in, plugging in. They didn't get to that point one minute before this YouTube video. They got five years of 10 years of training ahead of this or preceding this, excuse me. So, Think about that when you go into thing and then realize that anything that's worth doing takes effort and time. There's nothing that you're going to earn in life that's going to feel really rewarding and awesome if you could do it in one second. It takes lots of time to earn, you know, things that are big goals for you and you have to accept that and realize that you're not going to all get there at the same pace. You have someone that can show up to the gym and go from zero strict handstand pushups to 10 in two months. You know what their background is, but they're able to do that. It might take you three, five years to do that, but that's just your journey and realize that everything's personal. But where you're good at something, they're probably bad at something you're good at. So just realize there's always a trade-off here and not to get too wrapped up in what other people are doing because it has nothing to do with you. The... I mean, you get to see, like, sure, what you're talking about, first of all, great answer, but also, like, the must-be-nice crowd when so-and-so wins the CrossFit Games and they collapse and start crying. Do you think that they're crying because... You know, like they're sad and they didn't win the crowd. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're, they're crying because they sacrificed some ungodly amount of, you know, life and, you know, so much. It took the amount of shit that it takes to get to that point is done in the shadows. And like that's their moment of like, you know, it's done in the dark and they get to bring it to the light. And that's why it's so emotional for them. And it's like you either. You either have to accept that you don't actually want to trade places with that person because trading places with them 99.9% .9 of the days is holy fuck. Um, or you're like, it's this, is this, maybe this is actually possible for me. Like if I did double, triple sessions and 
slept 10 hours a night and, you know, ate, you know, 6,000 grams of carbs and was dry heaving <laughs> rice at 8 p.m. Like, like if, if you, if that's worth it for you to do it, then that's when you can, again, start to rewrite those stories. I think people should understand. I'm going to try to draw a couple, like a couple different ideas for this answer, because I, the, I think that the, at baseline for the athlete who doesn't, uh, who's kind of in that gray area, what you are essentially struggling from is the anxiety of indecision and a lack of direction. So you are like anxiety kind of like at baseline is a result of you being in kind of uncharted territory or you are, you know that you have decisions to make, but have not chosen to make them um, within the terms of like fitness and CrossFit, you know, let's say, you're an athlete who thinks they want to compete at a certain level, but isn't sure if they can do it. There's indecision there. There's anxiety about, well, is the is the is the season structure going to change again? Like, am I going to be on a team? Am I going to go individual? All of these kind of conversations that we have regularly with athletes about, like, hey, what's your plan for the season? What do you want to work on? Or you know, if it's less competitive base, it's like, what do you want to work on? The 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 anxiety and the the kind of like the negative self-talk and where the other voices start to come into play is when you haven't sat down and actually made a decision about what direction you want to go. And if it's, hey, I want to and it needs to be and it needs to be specific and it needs to be detailed and it needs to be, OK, I want to go to the semifinal. I want to be a semifinals level athlete. And, you know, maybe it's a you have to do some research or listen to a podcast or get into discord and ask. And you just say, it's like, okay, so you want to be a semifinals level athlete and you get someone like us who's able to say like, this is what it takes. Or you ask somebody else, like, what does it take to be a semifinals level athlete? And when they outline all of the things that are required as to what it takes, you can then decide like, yeah, I actually can one, I, I like logistically, my life is going to afford me the opportunity to do this and I'm and I'm going to do it or it's like, OK, turns out that my goal of being 7000th in the open and qualifying for the CrossFit Games actually isn't very realistic. Here is the like Sherb said, here's kind of the step by step process. And it needs to be that those breadcrumbs need to be laid out in the clearest, most concrete way that you can do it. Because that's what kind of shuts out the voices, the out, the outside factors that are giving you the, the, uh, the kind of the inconsistency and the indecision and the anxiety that you're ex- that you're experiencing because you don't have a a firm kind of goal. Like the again, the people who are not anxiety ridden are the people who have an established purpose. They know what they're going to work every day to do and to try to you know whether it's to uh, you know, um, support support your family. Whether it's a you've got a personal career goal, you've got a uh, you know you you're tr- you you work because you want to make sure that you have enough money to do other things that are completely unrelated to work. Whatever it is, there's a there's an established goal that is feeding that you are using as kind of like you are making the sacrifice necessary to achieve that goal, and it's concrete and established. Um, and the last kind of element that one of my one of my friends shared with me a speech. I don't remember what college or it was. A, it was a, basically a football coach that gave a kind of motivating speech to his players. And the I, the basis the basis was how how hard are you willing to sprint when the distance is unknown? So you've got you do have this goal. Maybe you have established a high level competitive goal. Like in reality, like you don't actually know how long it takes to get there. You could even ask us and we could give you a, a rough estimate like, hey, it, it, you, you know, you're probably like two or three seasons away from being a semifinals athlete. But that's that is, you know, that's going to be 25 percent accurate at best because we can't predict the future. We can't predict anything other than what we know right now. And three years from now is a very long time for things to change, for you to change, for your goals to change, all of that sort of stuff. And like Sherb said, it's like part of part of this kind of idea is that the higher the kind of the goal, the more sacrifice is required. But also the more the higher the goal, the more sacrifice that is required, the the more reward is at the end of that, you know, is 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 there when you slay that dragon, so to speak. 
Yeah, the the place that my mind goes with this is I, I love to reverse engineer um, really great outcomes for other athletes and explain some of the like common traits um, t- to people who are struggling with this. And um, two things come to mind, one being uh, really good athletes like chew up and spit out variants. They love it because they then have the ability to call upon all of these different scenarios. And my mind goes there because of Hunter bringing up what happens at every level subconsciously or consciously is skipping things that you should be doing. Like that might be the stupidest plan possible to get better at something. <laughs> not doing it, right? <laughs> like it doesn't get much worse than that, but we might not oh, know. Oh, that was going to work this year. Damn it. We might not know <laughs> that that's why that might be happening. But think of a scenario like a triplet with your worst movement in there and then your two favorite. You just get this opportunity to once again realize what fitness is and you're kind of, you just get into the pocket anyways and you get after it and you realize that your ability has improved and that maybe, you know, if you hate muscle ups and you think that if there's ever rowing with it that you can't do them, maybe that's not the case anymore. Maybe you get to improve. And then by extension of that, a lot of um, the top athletes in the sport sport have this like savant level knowledge of previous workouts that they've done. You hear them talking about it and they're like, yeah, October 6th, 2016, I'm pretty sure I broke those up 654. And you're like, the fuck are you talking about? That's crazy talk. But if that is a common trait at the highest level, then that tells us that they are the type of person that is creating proof over a super long period of time of how confident they should be and then going, having the ability to go call upon that proof. That's what we're trying to do as remote coaches. We are trying to trick you into doing all of the things that you said you couldn't do. You do really well because they're hidden and there's nuance and there's variance. And then we go, yeah, okay, I know it was announced and I know it's stressful and, you know, uh, adrenaline can be poison or fuel, but you already did it. It already happened. You know why they know that? Because they pay attention to the shit that matters. They're not worried about what their time was at the end of the workout. They were worried about like, hey, when I have 15 muscle ups, I'm going to go 9-3-3 or 8 fucking 4-3, whatever that is. That They're paying attention to things that actually matter. So, you know, I find the athletes that do that, they might not know what their Metcon score was. They might have an idea, but they're paying attention to stuff that actually is important. What their well, echo bike wattage was, what their muscle yeah, sets that, were. That's the difference in like the training and testing mindset that we talk so often about. It's like that athlete, going back to my point of kind of like the anxiety of the unknown, it's like, okay, muscle ups, like 15 reps, like how do you do it? Well, the athlete who's who you know, in their training pieces over the course of the year paid attention to like what you just said. It's like 15 muscle ups. Yeah. Easy day. 10, five, like done. Nope. Uh, that's actually six, five, four for me with about 30 seconds of rest in between, because I remember doing it on this day or, you know, I remember doing something similar. I took notes. Let me look, go back into my athlete log. All of a sudden, like the anxiety of the unknown is gone. It's like, this is how you're going to do it. And hopefully you've also developed enough kind of awareness as an athlete to say like, huh, like this is actually feeling better today. Maybe it's maybe it's nine, six instead of six, seven you know, or six, five, four, something like that. But again, that comes down to when I was training, I had a very specific goal and purpose and, and kind of I had information that I was seeking to find and, and to acquire so that I could actually implement it when it mattered. And that athlete who, you know, essentially was able to turn off the external noise, like Sherb said, or Drew, I don't remember which one of you said it, but like, no, I didn't, didn't matter that I didn't win the Metcon, like, but guess who's winning now? Because I know exactly how I'm (laughs) going to break up those muscle ups. And when you get there, you're nervous because you don't fucking know how you're going to feel and you're going to go conservative and you're going to do five sets of three with six hours of rest and a chalk break in between. And it's all, it's only because you were so hyper-focused on the outcome when you were supposed to be focusing on kind of the 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 present the the thing that you were trying to improve in the moment how often within this podcast when we're talking about all of these character traits that allow that gives someone the ability to fix this did we reference genetics zero every five seconds right that's what we did it's all genetics this is a genetics podcast Mm. got my chemistry set out yeah um, <laughs> the Jim's fucking naked in the office with a chemistry set. Get out of here. Freaks that have walked into our building over the years 
how well do they normally do in the sport? Well, they're not here. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it's not us? Fuck. It's not us. We, we were just, we decided to make everybody else feel good. So we, I think specimens in the business, we just stayed behind yeah. computer screens. I just they think it's so else. important to put out there that these things are workable and they are achievable and it's just more about the natural order of things and how hard it is to stay the course. Hunter talked about this idea of that unknown time horizon. Like how much am I willing to continue to chip away at this without knowing what that is? Um, and, you know, sure, you referenced some, some very similar things when it comes to, you know, patience. And those are things that we all have access to, that every single person has access to. We might have different goals, might have different pursuits. But if you want to be able to go in and achieve some of those things, it is a cop-out to say that you don't have fast twitch, slow twitch, I'm Born tall, muscles. I'm short. Born without muscles? Oh, my femur, oh no. Like, my arms are short, my arms are long, my hands are huge, you know, you know how that is. Um, like, those things are once again bringing us back to a story that we are telling ourselves that's probably narrated by somebody else. And that just sucks, especially if you're working hard. I just final thoughts to... That was now you have to go. <clears throat> yeah, I think yeah, so. I think it's a culmination. The, the, the number one thing I want to echo is just you got to pay attention to things that matter. Like it, so much being able to coach yourself if you don't have a remote coach is paying attention to the metrics that actually matter. So... Don't get wrapped up in your workout score. And if you do have a coach and they give you advice on how to do the workout, don't be a moron. Pay attention. Listen, they're trying to help you. A coach never gives you advice that's in your worst interest. It's always in your best interest. There are plenty I of people out that there. You're, they're, you're fucking with them is so crazy. Like I, it's, I'm always <laughs> out there for your benefit. Like It's the same thing that happens to the affiliate. So whether that's remote coaching or that's your affiliate class, if a coach comes to you and gives you advice, it's never for your detriment. It's always for your betterment. I have seen this goddamn movie a thousand times. <laughs> I've seen this movie. I know what's going to happen. You're going to break it up and sit around like an idiot. Don't do that. Go lighter. Go faster. Get a better workout. Get fitter. Again, I'm pounding the table and sound like a ridiculous person right now, but I'm always telling folks that if I make a mistake and you crush the workout, I'll come up to you and say, hey, man, I'm sorry. You should have used 95 pounds of those thrusters. But more often than not, I was dead on, and you're gonna, I'm going to walk over there and say, how'd that go? And they go, that fucking sucked. I'm like, yeah, I know it did. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. You're welcome, and I'll see you tomorrow. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Gets fired up. Damn, Damn sure was fired up. Present there, and yeah. so present. Well, yeah, I, I'll make my final thoughts that that topic because as somebody who I like self admittedly, I spend way more time thinking. Like, I spend way more time talking to myself in my own head than I do in. Reality, people. I guess, maybe. Uh, and that, that just doesn't, that doesn't go so well for me for like, for a, I don't know, like a thousand different reasons. And he's going to respond up there. The I do. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, trust me. I'm aware. Yeah. Um, they, yeah. Watch that it's, show. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's overwhelming to be honest. It's, it's really difficult because I'm, you know, you're a lot of, I spend a lot of time consistently worried about the next thing. Um, and part of that is the nature of, like my job, uh, like, and responsibilities and the historically like being in a, you know, the, the military, I spent a lot of time. You're caught. You're always thinking about the next thing. You're always anticipating problems. You're always trying to come up with solutions to things that haven't happened yet because you're pretty sure that they will. And you want to be ready for them if they do. Um, but that's not the right way to approach something like, like training. There's value, there's value in that, um, but there, there has to be, you have to have the ability to shut that off and kind of immerse yourself in that present moment, what's happening around you at the time, be able to turn off the voices in your head and when it's time to train, say like, okay, my goal for these muscle ups today is 654. I'm going to do 654 at the expense of my entire workout no matter what because I want to know what happens when I do it. And at the end of that training piece, like, I promise you are not going to be disappointed because of the clock at the end. You're going to be excited that the fact that you, like, were able to, one, hold yourself to that standard of, like, no, I'm not I'm not going to get distracted by 
the person in the corner of my eye who's 30 seconds ahead of me. I'm not going to be distracted by that 17 and a half minute time that I know is out there looming that maybe I'll get, but maybe I won't. But it doesn't fucking matter because it's December in, you know, it's a Tuesday in December. So my my message, my kind of guidance for the athlete is to to try to work on that. And if you're not sure how, like meditation has been super helpful for me personally. Um, it like sure mentioned, it takes time to get to to get good at and not not even get good at, but just to like kind of start to feel like the benefits and be able to kind of turn yourself from like, OK, I'm spending way too much time in my own head thinking about thinking about things as opposed to like immersing yourself into what's actually happening to you in real life at that moment. And I think you can really, you can, you'd be surprised at how much you can like get out of yourself when you, uh, when, when you kind of focus, hyper focus yourself in that present moment and what's actually happening in reality, not the story that you've told yourself in your head. Amen. You got Ted. Did we do it? <laughs> yeah, final thoughts. Uh, I mean, you guys talk about it a lot or have historically talked about it a lot. Um, you you don't have the right to call something a weakness until you've actually put time into working on it. Um, so for anybody out there, don't allow yourself, don't give yourself permission to call something a weakness if you regularly and knowingly avoid doing it. Um, give yourself the amount of time that it takes to get to a point where you can actually call it a weakness because you've tried to crush it and it just isn't isn't getting there and then call us and get a remote coach i mean that's probably what you need true i mean it's an easy way out right to do that and yep. you probably if you're listening to this podcast you have proof somewhere else probably in a particular modality whether it's weightlifting or conditioning or skill or somewhere in your life where you know you went through that process and got better at something so Leave the cop outs for other people and just dig into it. Yep. Agreed. Did we do it? We did it. Yeah. Cheer. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Misfit Podcast. And thank you to our show sponsors. You can head to properfuel.co, use the code word Misfit to save on the best supplements in the game. You can head to sharpentheaxco.com, use your favorite athlete code. You save some money. They get some money to go to the finally announced semifinals and CrossFit Games locations and dates. Thank goodness. Unless you're a Masters or a Teens athlete, I apologize for saying that. And MisfitAthletics.com for your individual programming needs. TeamMisfit.com for your affiliate programming needs. We'll see you next week.